Okay, it is 10 a.m. So I believe we can begin. Thank you to all of our attendees and all of our panelists uh, for this, this panel on Africana Studies, Digital Humanities and Applied Interdisciplinarity at UNF. Um, we'll have a, a wonderful conversation this morning. I am Dr. True Leverett. I direct Africana Studies and I'm an associate professor in the Department of English. And I am joined by co-hosts. Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. My name is Sarah Matthijs. I'm the director of the Office of Interdisciplinary Programs. Um, and uh, we're just sort of delighted to have um, this group of folks sharing their work um, in particular kind of on, uh, as our title suggests, applied interdisciplinarity and some of the incredible things that can come when we work in and through disciplinary boundaries. Good morning, my name is Ann Fister. I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of North Florida and Director of the Digital Humanities Institute or DHI. The DHI, as we know, promotes collaboration on interdisciplinary projects and the projects that are highlighted here are some of really our showcase projects um, that really embody the public facing um, and interdisciplinary nature of the work we do at DHI. So I'm, I'm happy and proud to be here. Thanks. So our format this morning, um, each of uh, the co-hosts will introduce um, someone to speak about a project and we'll just go down the line. Each presenter, um, each professor will have five minutes uh, to talk about their project and then um, each student um, will have three minutes to talk about the projects with which they were involved. So um, as Dr. McCarl has put in the chat, please um, take a visit to the uh, URL to the website that he's added a link to so that you can be familiar with all of the projects discussed in this session. Um, thank you for that. So we'll begin uh, with Dr. Laura Heffernan, who is working on the Viola Muse Digital Edition. Dr. Heffernan is an Associate Professor of English at UNF and she teaches courses on 19th and 20th century literary history and the digital humanities. Good morning. Good morning. Um, am I correct that we're not going to screen share for this? We're just going to sort of chat because screen share is disabled. OK, that's fine. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Viola Muse digital edition that I've been working on with Dr. Leverett and also um, Dr. McCarl and several students who are here to present today. Um, Viola Muse lived in Jacksonville in the 1920s, 1930s, 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way through her death in um, the early 80s. She was a member of the Negro Writers Unit of the Florida Federal Writers Project. Um, the Florida Federal Writers Project was a New Deal era, Works Progress Administration, um, massive kind of nationwide attempt to employ out of work writers, librarians, journalists to, um, to write the history um, or to write a sort of guide to the present of America. So, you know, dry, they wrote state guides, they collected local folklore. Um, and Florida was one of the first states to develop a Negro writers unit. Um, and it was a relatively large one compared to the other states. There were about 10, um, 10 people who worked as part of that office um, from 1936 to 1939. They worked out of the Clara White mission downtown because of um, Jim Crow segregation. The, the, the main office uh, was in a municipal building on Adams Street, but the Negro Writers Unit um, worked out of the Clara White mission. And um, what we've been working with are the notes and drafts, then typescripts that Muse left behind um, that provides a record of the work that she did for the Negro Writers Unit. That's a collection that ended up at the Jacksonville Historical Society. Meanwhile, most of the rest of that, um, the Negro Writers Unit papers ended up at the Florida Historical Society and has since been published in book form um, finally in the 1990s. But the Muse collection, because it was so Jacksonville based, ended up staying here with us. Um, and so it hasn't really been publicized or published or written about by scholars. And our, our aim is to make a digital edition of um, all of her papers. And so the digital edition is hosted by the Omeka platform that is available to all UNF faculty. It's a good platform for, um, 
for collections um, because you can sort of have items within it. So each of the documents in the Muse archive has is an item in our collection. Uh, we've worked to create good transcripts of each of the documents, um, sort of faithful transcripts, but also then reading transcripts because we want the final edition to be fairly usable. Um, and in its final form, the edition will have photographs of Muse um, that, oh, that have been housed at the Ritz um, Museum downtown. And we are also going to have editorial essays that kind of frame the importance of the collection, its historical interest um, and its local interest. We have as well built um, a, a several layers of maps that help you kind of visualize exactly where Muse was conducting interviews with her subjects um, because she went around to local schools, to local homes, she interviewed people about their accomplishments, and she also conducted um, some of the famous interviews with formerly enslaved people in Jacksonville so we can kind of see where those people were living. Uh, when Muse was speaking with them. So that's pretty much an overview of the VMDE project. Um, we're hoping to wrap up work on it at the end of this summer. Um, we have a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities to do this work, um, and that grant ends in August. But we're also hoping that this will be kind of a spin-off project because it does connect to so many sort of histories of Jacksonville, um, so many other projects that are being undertaken by the DHI and has a lot of potential to sort of move forward in different directions. Great, thanks, Laura. <clears throat> Pardon me. Next, we'll hear from Dr. David Scheffler on the, uh, about the Red Hill Cemetery project. David Scheffler is chair of the Department of History at the University of North Florida and a medievalist by training. He has published works on late medieval education, the Crusades, and late medieval uh, heresy. I'm, I'm giggling a little bit because this was the introduction last time to which you said, David, quite a transition from that. So sorry I didn't update that. I'm only now realizing it. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I, I've been working um, with uh, actually with Dr. Bevel and a number of other uh, faculty at UNF, including um, Dr. Chris Baynard, uh, Mike Boyles, and Dr. Gordon Rakita, um, and a number of students. You'll hear from uh, one of them here later um, as well. Um, on the Red Hill Cemetery project, Red Hill Cemetery is located in Waycross, Georgia. Uh, we were contacted uh, uh, about five years ago now, before I was chair, um, about uh, assisting the Okefenokee Heritage Center and the Black Heritage Committee, which was part of the Okefenokee Heritage Center in documenting the, uh, the cemetery. Uh, the cemetery had been neglected since the 1960s. Um, it was uh, overgrown, uh, had suffered from uh, both neglect and in some cases uh, uh, vandalism. Uh, and um, we, we agreed to take on the project and we started to build what I like to think of as a kind of virtual cemetery. Um, the project itself has kind of five major components. Um, there's a mapping component that we're working on, uh, mapping the cemetery itself, and we're working with anthropology, archaeology uh, to put together uh, a, a map of the, the cemetery and as many of the burial sites as we can. Um, we're also gathering um, archival documents, uh, scanning them and making them uh, searchable, uh, again, through Omeka uh, as well. Uh, particularly right now, we've been working with death certificates. Um, this allows us uh, as well to, um, uh, to map the uh, African-American neighborhoods within uh, Waycross at the time because the death certificates include uh, a lot of additional information within them beyond dates of birth and death. Uh, it also includes uh, an oral history component. Um, we started to gather those oral histories. Um, we had originally planned to do so right when COVID hit and that uh, delayed us a couple of years, um, but we've begun now to um, revive that project that we actually plan on uh, going up on Thursday to gather a couple of more um, oral histories. Uh, those include, we've encouraged um, people who wish to be interviewed to bring documents and photographs and things um, uh, to those interviews that if they're willing to share them, we're making those available as well. Um, and then two additional components. Um, Dr. Bevel has been working with one of her uh, graduate undergraduate courses uh, to develop uh, a history uh, focused on 
uh, really the late 19th and early 20th century, which is when the majority of the burials um, uh, took place. Um, we have perhaps, it's a, it's a five to six acre site and there are perhaps as many as 2000 burials, many of which are no longer identifiable, but we're working on as many of those as we can. Um, so the students are helping to produce uh, some of the history for the site. And then uh, we also would like to develop uh, uh, some pedagogical materials that could be used, particularly in K-12, uh, as part of um, the, uh, the, the project that we would, we would make those available to, to teachers uh, who, who might wish to access them. Um, so that's kind of where the project is. Um, there are a lot, there's still a lot to do. Uh, and we're continuing to gather materials. Um, it's gonna be an ongoing project probably for years to come as members of the community approach us. Um, we've started to get a lot more contact with uh, descendant communities who are interested in participating. And I think that will just allow the project to continue to grow. Thanks, David. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Felicia Bevel, Assistant Professor of History at UNF uh, and Specialist in 20th Century America, and Susan Suitos, the Head of Special Collections and University Archives in UNF's Thomas G. Carpenter Library. So the project that Dr. Bevel and I will be describing is editing the Eartha M. M. White Collection. The Eartha M. M. White Collection is the cornerstone of UNF's Special Collections. Uh, UNF acquired a portion of Eartha White's estate in 1975, a year after her death. Her papers were the first primary source collection that was donated to the university's library. Detailing the notable activities of Ms. White, the collection documents an African-American community in a Southern city for almost a hundred years from the, from the 1870s to the 1970s. Eartha White was an educator, a philanthropist, an entrepreneur, a humanitarian who was involved with the local and national NAACP, anti-lynching movement, universal suffragism, and community advocacy. The Eartha M. M. White collection also provides a snapshot into an area of Jacksonville that's rapidly gentrifying and disappearing. The collection spanning 48 linear feet includes personal and business correspondence, documents, notes, memorabilia, printed materials, ephemera, and photographs. Since its donation, the Eartha M. M. White collection has been one of the most accessed collections by students, faculty, and outside researchers. In an effort to make the primary sources, resources of the Eartha M. M. White collection more discoverable online, my predecessor, Dr. Aisha Johnson-Jones and Dr. McCarl started the editing the Eartha M. M. White collection project in 2016. This project is centered on creating electronic versions of Ms. White's handwritten personal correspondence and other documents using TEI XML to encode transcriptions of the contents. This collaborative textual editing project is intended to give UNF students experience in working with archival materials and to take on a variety of roles such as transcribers, editors, and annotators. Thank you, Susan. Um, so as Susan mentioned, um, the Eartha M. M. White collection has been a really useful pedagogical resource for faculty working within and alongside Africana studies. Um, and so in courses that I teach, such as introduction to African American history, uh, the civil rights movement, civil war and American memory and others like it, looking at this collection has been really useful um, in helping students understand the importance of the local, right? And in, in thinking about and engaging with black history. Um, and so students have engaged with this both in the classroom, right? Whether it's discussing um, various archival material as a sort of an entire group discussion in class or by visiting um, other sites on campus like special collections. Um, and so Susan and Jennifer Biff have been really helpful um, the past couple of years in really facilitating conversations in the archive itself um, and for students thinking about the, the importance of engaging with this type of history. Um, and so, for instance, when students are, you know, for instance, looking at correspondence between Eartha White and A. Philip Randolph um, about, you know, planning and coordinating a local Black history conference, 
they're able to really understand the role of Black women like Eartha White in preserving that history. And also the sort of network of activists and scholars whom Eartha White was in conversation with, right? And to understand this kind of larger genealogy of Black activism that includes A. Philip Randolph, right? A really important labor activist in the 20th century. Um, James Weldon Johnson, co-creator of uh, the Negro National Anthem, NAACP executive secretary, as well as Rodney Hurst, local civil rights activist who's very, who's still very active today. Um, but it also allows students to understand this sort of long tradition of advocating for representation in public spaces, right? One that dates back to the 19th century with emancipation celebrations, and one that moves forward to the present as K through 12 and college educators uh, continue to fight for the right to, to teach black history, right? Amidst, amidst the many legislative changes that are happening uh, most recently. And so the work that Dr. Jack, Dr. Aisha Johnson Jones, Dr. McCarl, um, and now Susan have done to preserve and present this collection um, and particularly to present it to the public continues this tradition as well, right? A tradition that many students um, like our very own history major, Lynn Hemingway, have really um, taken advantage of in really productive ways. Um, and so one such student-led project that has resulted from the Eartha M. M. White collection um, has been the editing of the Eartha M. M. White collection um, led by history major, Lynn Hemingway, whom you'll hear from a little bit later. Um, so I had the wonderful opportunity to mentor along with Dr. McCarl Lynn over the past couple of years as she curated two online exhibits related to the collection, one about Black women's activism and one about preserving Black historical memory. Um, and so the work that she has completed really shows the importance of uh, making such collections accessible um, to the public, right, and how you do that work. Um, both responsibly and ethically. So as I said before, Lynn will discuss her work in more detail a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you, Susan and Felicia. Next, we'll hear from Dr. James Beasley on the um, digital collaborations with the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center. Dr. Beasley is an associate professor and teaches courses in historic, rhetorical history, theory, and research. His work with the UNF Digital Humanities Institute and the Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center has been previously published in the article Process After Product, an Electric Model for Community-Based Learning in Tech Shop Experiments in the Summer of 2020. Thank you, True. I am putting a couple more uh, links in the chat. Um, so the work that the Digital Humanities Institute has been doing uh, with the Lincolnville Museum uh, and Cultural Center in St. Augustine is tied to a larger consortium of libraries and um, archives in St. Augustine to celebrate Black history uh, throughout the last couple of years. So um, every spring, uh, the English uh, Digital Humanities course that I teach uh, rhetoric in the Digital Humanities has worked with the Lincolnville Museum to uh, discover what projects uh, they would be interested in our students working on for them. And then we uh, utilize the materials from the St. Augustine Historical Society uh, to accomplish those purposes. Last year, we worked with Susan Suaitos on the uh, USCT pension records and uploaded those to the Resilience Omeka site as well. Uh, so this semester, uh, we're working with the Lincolnville Museum on a, a specific project on uh, historic Black businesses in uh, the Lincolnville neighborhoods. So students uh, have done research in the um, uh, in the uh, Florida Master Site files. Uh, we've also done research with the Sanborn uh, fire insurance maps, and um, they are presenting their work in several different places this semester. Uh, first of all, is on the Omeka site, um, entering that metadata. Um, the second is a pop-up archive presentation on May 7th at the Lincolnville Museum, uh, celebrating Black businesses. Uh, and then the third um, part of this project this semester is uh, the creation of original 
uh, dialogues among the uh, members of the community. And Joshua Smith has a fantastic uh, uh, story that he's written uh, based on uh, Henry Eubanks, uh, a barber in Lincolnville. So uh, he might mention that at some point, but um, that that writing will be available on the uh, Resilience webpage on May 2nd as well. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. So uh, I appears that Dr. LaRose is not here, but um, she has been working on a project that's called Building a Digital Archive of Haitian Folk Tales Within the Haitian Diaspora. That's Dr. Marie LaRose, who's an assistant professor of languages, literatures, and cultures. And unfortunately, Dr. Greg Helmick is also unable to join us this morning, um, but he's been working on a project called Mapping Hispanic and Black Bilingual Jacksonville in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and that project is really looking at late 20th and 21st um, <coughs> century Hispanic um, Caribbean literature and cultural studies. Um, I'm sorry, that's, um, I'm looking at the sheet here. That's Dr. Helmick's specialization. Um, the project is really looking at um, figures of nationhood and migration and um, the way in which language um, and bilinguality in particular um, uh, really is, um, has kind of a long history and situation here in Jacksonville. Great, so next we will hear from Dr. Clayton McCarl about the project Antioquia Negra Digital Archive and the North Florida Editorial Workshop. Thanks, True. In 2019, Dr. Constanza Lopez and I led a study abroad trip to Colombia, and I did a sort of digital editing on site experiment with the students um, for my course that was part of that trip. We worked with a document that is uh, located at the Regional Historical Archive in Medellin. It's the Regional Archive of Antioquia, which is the, the, the department of Colombia of which uh, Medellin is the capital. Uh, it's a document I first found through, um, there's a digitization project, the National Historical Archive, that um, put online uh, documents related to Afro-Colombian history from all around the country, uh, much of which is housed in Bogota, but, but other documents uh, also that came from the regional archives. So I found one in, in Medellin. We went to the, um, to, the, to the archive itself and we handled, we were able to look at the document itself, um, but we worked mostly from digital images and we created uh, a partial digital edition of it. It's a document from 1713, a criminal case uh, in which an, an enslaved woman uh, was accused of witchcraft, um, use, using witchcraft against her, her master. Um, and interestingly, uh, she was acquitted. Uh, it was a, it's a very involved uh, legal process, which ultimately resulted in what seems like a somewhat um, fair outcome. Which we, we, the, the, both the students and I were very surprised um, by the nature of that. Uh, what seemed it's the first like a sham trial actually had some uh, substance to it. Uh, the next summer I was not able to um, lead that trip because of COVID and so I taught a digital editing course online in English and we focused on um, archival materials from North Florida. Most of what we worked with is in special collections at UNF. Susan helped us to um, access those documents. But one of the documents we worked with is uh, at the St. Augustine Historical Society. And it is a, um, it's a census of enslaved persons that's part of the will of Abraham DuPont. Um, and so the, the, the two projects are connected because that document, um, the, so the, the documents from Columbia form part of something I'm building called the Antioquia Negra Digital Archive. Um, the fall after that trip, I worked with some students in a Latin American culture course on another document, which is located in Santa Fe de Antioquia, which is the regional, uh, which is the colonial capital of Antioquia. And it was a census of enslaved persons from 1840 from that area, from all the small towns, um, a document that was mostly created for taxation purposes. Um, a very startling uh, sort of uh, piece of textual material. In that summer 2020 course, one of my students, Matthew, who's here today, and he's gonna talk a bit about his work he worked with this document, um, this part of Abraham DuPont's will, which is a similar document from the 1850s, a decade later, um, and not from Columbia, but from St. John's County, uh, which, is a, which is a similar uh, enumeration of human beings. So I'm gonna let Matthew uh, talk more about that when it's his, his time. And before Dr. Fister introduces, <clears throat> excuse me, the students, I neglected to give Dr. McCarl's bio. I apologize. <laughs> 
So let me introduce Dr. McCarl, who just spoke uh, with us. Um, he's an associate professor of Spanish and digital humanities. His research and teaching interests include colonial Latin America, book history, and digital editing. Great, thanks everyone. Um, so next we will hear short summaries of student involvement in, in some of these projects. Um, Amelia Dixon, an English major and also a spring 2022 DHI intern on the Viola Muse Digital Edition uh, will uh, speak to us first on the creation of pedagogical materials. Thanks, Amelia. Yeah. So um, last fall, I participated in an internship with the Biomuse Digital Edition. And a lot of the work that I did um, centered around preparing the papers to be displayed in a digital format. So I was pretty heavily involved in hands-on tasks like um, transcribing, encoding, um, and editing the documents, um, with the editing being mostly for uh, formatting and regularization purposes. And I also did a lot of proofreading too, so I was able to get really immersed in the material. Um, I also conducted what I guess you could refer to as comparative research, um, in which I reviewed other collections that Viola Muse's papers have been included in uh, to see how her work had been represented in the past. So, for example, the Library of Congress website houses the Works Progress Administration's um, slave narrative collection. So that one has two of Muse's narratives, or I should say a version of Muse's narratives um, that she wrote from her interviews with former slaves. And what I was able to do was take the original version from the digital edition, um, put it next to the alternate version that came from the external source and take um, a side-by-side -side look. And this approach would usually allow me to locate um, any possible editorial changes that had been made. Um, and it was really eye-opening to see just how many changes had been made, had been made and how it like affected the overall narrative. And then this spring, I am in the midst, or I guess finishing up, and another internship with Dr. McCarl. Um, it sort of emerged from my work last fall. And we're working to develop the framework for potential pedagogical materials um, related to various public history projects, um, a few of which are represented here today. And um, so I'm currently investigating what other public history projects have done um, with their teaching material in the past, um, which will sort of help us form a basis for our own, um, as well as determine the best way to balance what our project leaders envision for their projects um, and what local teachers and by extension the school system are willing to implement in their classroom um, because there are a lot of standards and expectations that have to be met for something like this to be successful. Thank you, Amelia. We'll hear from Lynn Hemingway, a history and Spanish major about work on the Red Hill Cemetery project and editing the Eartha M. M. White collection. Thanks, Lynn. Well, I don't think we can hear you. No. You hear me now? Yes. There we go. Okay, I switched the switch microphone. So this should be, I'm sorry if it sounds off. I guess headset is not working. Um, so yeah, so I've worked on both the, um, kind of had a, a, my hands in a few pies here. Um, I've worked in the Earth, editing the Earth M. M. White collection project. Um, I served as um, a student intern, more kind of like a, a student leader of the project uh, for two years from uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, and in that, uh, in my position as kind of the, the, the intern for the project, um, I was allowed a good amin amount of independence. Um, so not only was I leading um, fellow students through the editing project, a process of um, creating editions of these documents, of doing all the technical work using um, TEI XML and all the software that's involved with that. Um, I also worked with um, uploading those, those documents online, handled the website for the most part. Um, because of the independence I was allowed, I was allowed to concern myself with questions such as access. So I worked hard to promote the project um, online through things like social media, um, I was also thinking about how to make uh, various documents more easily searchable. So 
um, with TIXML, we encode into the document. Uh, we tag semantic features, so things like names of peoples, places, organizations. Um, and I sought to use um, Omeka Classic's built-in tagging feature to highlight those semantic features to make um, make it more accessible for users to find what they're looking for. Um, and I also was allowed to think about things such as, um, I, I thought it was important to include uh, interpretive text with each document, such as the um, exhibits that Dr. Bevel um, mentioned earlier. Um, the valuable information in these documents can be kind of lost without some contextual information. So I wanted to have exhibits as um, sort of a starting point for users to be able to better understand these documents. Um, and I also wanted to work to kind of intentionally highlight specific narratives that are present in the Earth and M.M. White collection, such as like Dr. Rebel was talking about these um, kind of uh, networks of black, black activists working together and inspiring each other. And particularly um, the one I kind of focused a lot on was like black club women, particularly. Um, and I've also served as um, a summer intern for the Red Hill Cemetery Project in 2020. I generally did a lot of the technical work, um, helping build the database that uh, Dr. Shuffler mentioned previously, as well as I've also contributed to um, writing some of the future, the forthcoming um, uh, historical narratives that will be on the project's website to go along with this database to, to uh, provide more interpretive context, uh, to content to provide more context. Um, so I'm working with Dr. Bevel's course to write um, a narrative. We're focusing on the themes of violence, resistance, and memory and space uh, that are present in Red Hill. And um, for some of us, kind of just more the general way across Georgia community more broadly. Um, so that's that's one element in which I'm engaged, uh, one way in which I'm engaged with the, uh, the, the project. Um, as far as my technical work is concerned, um, regarding the database, um, I added the first 200 death certificates to that database and generally helped I kind of work out, outline the approaches to um, transcribing the documents, to gathering all the data present on the death certificates and um, being able to bulk upload that data onto the, onto the database to just make everything much more smoother. Um, and also this, as with um, editing of MM White, accessibility and searchability is very important to me. So I was very intentional in, um, um, in making the search engine for that database um, kind of straightforward and also detailed. So I added, um, I worked to add a model called uh, numeric data types, which is uh, only usable for the Omega X platform that we use for it. Um, and that allows users to search uh, numeric values um, in specific ways. So you can search before and after a date, particularly. So before the generic um, search engine built into Omega S doesn't use that. Um, so I wanted to make sure to uh, make, make the um, database a bit more functional for potential researchers. Um, yeah, so that's what I've done on those projects. Uh, thank you for letting me speak again. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Melinda Peacock, a Spanish major, on her work on the Viola Muse Digital Edition. Hey, so my work on the Viola Muse Digital Edition started in um, September of last year. I am the student assistant to the director of the Digital Humanities Institute, Dr. Pfister. So I have access to the scanners in the DHI suite. So I scanned all of the the handwritten documents in the Viola Muse edition, and I uploaded them to the Omeka website as 600 DPI TIFF files, so that there are there are more um, there are better and higher quality images on the website um, because previously there were just JPEGs from taken by a cell phone, and then. I also helped to organize the website. Um, I made sure that all the links worked when I was logged out of the website. And I also made sure that all the project contributors were entered in the correct order. They're ordered by um, the task that they did. So first document scanning, then 
and transcription, then encoding, and lastly, editing. And I also um, linked related documents. For example, there, there are a series of documents, like there's a series of three documents titled Anna Scott Narrative. I linked those so that if, if you go to Anna Scott Narrative 1, you can go directly to Anna Scott Narrative 2 and 3. Lastly, I encoded a few of the documents. I, I have previous encoding experience with a Colonial Lab project that I did with Dr. McCarl in the summer and fall. So I encoded a few of the Viola Muse documents in the Oxygen TEI XML editor. And I, they were already transcribed. So I proofread those transcriptions to make sure that they matched their original documents. And I also added some of those semantic markings that Len mentioned uh, to label the names of people, places, and institutions within those documents. Great, thanks, Melinda. Um, Joshua Smith is an English major. We'll hear from him next. It sounds like Josh has, uh, Joshua, pardon me, has been working on several projects, not unlike many of the students here on our um, session today. So Joshua, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, um, well, hello. Uh, so yeah, it is true. I have been working on several projects um, in this Digital Humanities Institute. Uh, the one with Dr. Beasley, um, his writing as social action class. I have been, um, yeah, we I have been writing a story uh, about a specific barber who lived in Lincolnville, uh, St. Augustine. Uh, so we take a true historical figure and fictionalize his narrative in order to look for um, certain rhetorical devices, hidden stories, um, just a lot of things that maybe weren't told. And we use, I guess, fiction or prose or uh, different different uh, concepts like dialogue or third person narrative to, I guess, elaborate on his life during that time. Uh, so I guess look out for that soon. And then I've been a working uh, with, uh, uh, Professor True Leverett and Dr. Heffernan, and I've received several emails from Clayton McCarl as well. I, I um, took a class from him as well uh, last summer, yeah, 2021. And um, but yeah, with this current project, uh, Dr. True and Professor Heffernan have uh, I've worked with them with trying to find like the Viola Muse, like her different narratives, and see if like they've been put into larger, like more national work, see how much of her stuff was taken. So two publications that I had to uh, look through were the Chicago Defender and the Atlanta Daily World. Both of those um, seems like they didn't borrow from Viola Muse very much, which is unfortunate. However, that doesn't take away from any of the stuff that Viola did. Um, reading all of her, uh, I guess, journalistic endeavors uh, I was really drawn to the slave narratives and the specific ones that I was drawn to were um let me get my notes here uh so there were four um Irene Coates Charles Coates Lindsay Moore Willis Williams and Felix Littlejohn so I think just narratives of formerly enslaved persons I think can be very I don't know, it's just interesting because you're hearing it directly from that person. But I was drawn actually to something even more specific within those narratives, which uh, was food. Um, things like cornbread, peas, greens, sweet potatoes, turnips. If I read those out to you, it sounds more like a menu. But um, if you contextualize those things and see exactly why they were bringing those things up, it was very interesting that a lot of the slaves tied food to condition. So they would name like all the different foods, common foods of the South, things we would refer to as soul food or comfort food, but um, they would separate those things. And I noticed that there was a hierarchy. So when they mentioned something like meat, it was always, um, they would reference what was for the black people at the time and what was for the white people at the time. For example, chicken was rare for black people, at least in our local region. And from the narratives I looked at, um, if it was given to black people during the time, it was a Sunday thing. So that's another thing that food was also tied to specific days. Um, 
So biscuits were another thing that were rare for enslaved uh, people at the time to be able to eat. It was also something separated on Sundays. And so I've been working on like trying to build a larger project based on that. Um, just seeing like, I called it a food economy. Um, so working title, uh, maybe food hierarchy works better, but it was just a very interesting to see how when you look deeper into a lot of their stories, they're connected to a lot of items, I guess. And um, that's always just kind of a interesting thing, I guess. Um, and then lastly, uh, there was another thing within clothes. I found uh, clothes always, I think even today represent you, but a lot of their stuff was about like sewing and cloth and it was more than just a job, I think. Because, I mean, they even describe when they got certain things, going shoeless for an extended period of time in one narrative. And then, you know, once they become older, they get shoes. And I think just looking deeper into that and seeing how these things were tied together to make, I don't know, not just a bigger story, but connect them to, like, what they what they represented. Uh, sorry, I'm struggling here, a little nervous first time. But... um. Yeah, that's primarily what I've been doing so far. So hopefully the project comes together. Thank you for sharing that, Joshua. Matthew Welcome is an art history major, an English major, and a Spanish major who has worked on the North Florida Editorial Workshop. All right, can y'all hear me? All right, perfect. Um, so I worked with uh, Dr. McCarl uh, a couple of summers ago in the North Florida uh, editorial workshop, and I've worked with uh, Lynn as well um, in a couple of projects, but the particular document that I'm here to discuss today um, is the schedule of Negro property um, uh, from the will and testament of uh, Abraham DuPont. Um, and so I... Uh, Basically, I did the uh, transcription of this very, very large document filled with the names, um, capacities, prices, uh, ages, uh, familial ties, and et cetera, of uh, 169 enslaved people spanning, I believe, 27 uh, and some odd families. Um, and a couple who were uh, who didn't have families, uh, and so I don't know if you want me to go into like the the content of the uh, stuff right now. Um, uh, try to confirm that with Dr. You Leffer. do have time. Okay, sure. Um, and so uh, some of the uh, interesting things about um, this uh, this particular document is that you get a lot from what's seemingly very little um and i know i say very little and there are 169 names but but you know work with me here um so it's you know it's just uh, at the end of the day like you know it's like a list um but what you get from you know analyzing trends and you know uh, establishing bell curves and uh stuff like that is you can see the general um uh how how these enslaved peoples were valued uh, at the time. And if you take this particular document uh, and you juxtapose it with a document that came right after, which was the um, the list of, <clears throat> excuse me, the list of animal property and tools uh, that followed, you'll see that these lists are very, very similar. They're structured in very similar ways. And so you get to see sort of just how deep the racism ran uh, at this time period and how uh, basically black people, uh, enslaved black people were likened to tools. Um, and so it's it's a very, very like haunting and disturbing document, but there, there are some benefits that we can take um, by uh, sort of analyzing this uh, document in sort of a different context. Um, and so some of the things that are uh, potentially can be used for good are, um, uh, ideas of genealogists being able to use a list like this to uh, track um, like geographically and locally uh, 
you know, black families who may have descended from, uh, you know, contemporary black families who may have descended from some of these people, uh, because obviously, since we have the names and ages, we can get a pretty good idea of, you know, when these people, um, you know, were born, reproduced, died, etc. Um, and we also get to see uh, some interesting ideas on how uh, interesting ideas on gender uh, in particular and how gender affected value uh, at the time, because on average, uh, women were valued uh, less than men and a strong working, you know, mill hand uh, who's like in his 20s to 30, like, um, like 20s, 30s ish. Uh, would be valued at sort of the highest price, whereas you have typically like um, infants, older women, uh, et cetera, sitting on the lower price. And so the high uh, in terms of money here was about, uh, I believe, $1,300. And the low, we have someone going for as low as 10. Um, and so it's, it's a very, very disturbing document to work with. Um, but I think that there are a lot of things that you can glean from this document um, and sort of uh, without ignoring the history, you can recontextualize the document to hopefully use it for a much better purpose than its original intended purpose. Thanks, Matthew. And thanks again to all our student interns and the students working with these faculty. I know the faculty that are here and beyond this session are um, share my feelings of like gratitude for what you're doing and real pride in the work that, that you've done. Um, and I would, if I may, just take a moment to say to faculty, the work that you all are doing and involving these young people is, is really incredible. It's a service to them. It equips them with skills that they can take forward to graduate school, which many of them are moving on to graduate school and into their lives beyond UNF. So a round of applause to you all. You've done really wonderful, wonderful work. So we have um, the remainder of our time together um, to, do, to do a little bit of discussion or to, um, we'll host a little bit of discussion. Um, before we begin, are there any comments that or questions that you all have for one another that we wanna begin with? Otherwise we have some pre-prepared questions that we can sort of throw out and then people can sort of at will, I guess, uh, volunteer to answer those questions. I'll add as well that anyone in our audience, I think that they can create questions in the chat. Oh, okay, thank you, thanks. So if there are any audience questions for the panelists, then please do share those in the chat. Could I, I, I was gonna just, to follow up on what Dr. Fister was saying, I, I was in watching all of the presenters and the students particularly, I was struck by one, you know, the true interdisciplinary nature of all of these projects. We have students engaged in, in coding. Uh, we have students um, doing archival research that, that uh, sort of crosses disciplinary boundaries in really fascinating ways. Um, Red Hill Project, we've got uh, we, we just um, spoke to a student about uh, writing a, a, a musical piece uh, to accompany um, our interviews. So we were involving the, the, the School of Music. We've got um, GPS uh, work. Uh, and I just, it, it's so exciting to see all of the ways in which our students are engaged in these kinds of projects and the way in which it crosses all of these interdisciplinary boundaries is just is stunning to me to see it all together, you know, is, is very impressive. Absolutely. Thank you for that comment. And Laura, you've got your hand up. Um, I don't want to put her on the spot, but I was, I wanted to ask Dr. Bevel to speak a little bit about the late 19th, early 20th century course that she's teaching that incorporates Red Hill and maybe other projects too. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Laura. Um, yeah, so this semester I developed a new course. Uh, it's a four or five level. Um, so it has mostly undergraduates and then three, three, ma three master students. Well, Lynn has been serving as a graduate student in the class. She's basically one already. <laughs> um, and so this class um, is really sort of, there's two parts to the class. Um, during the first half of the semester, we really were reading a range of texts um, that uh, you know, had students think about 
various ways that you can encounter the archive, right? Redefining the archive, right? Not just as sort of the traditional physical repository, but you know, how do archives emerge in the digital world? How, mm -hmm. how do we understand personal archives, right? That are in private homes or um, public space as archives, right? Cemeteries <laughs> as archives. Um, and so the first half of the semester, they were really um, reading text to, to think through those questions of, of preserving, collecting, and, and making accessible um, often distorted or altogether erased Black voices. And then towards the second half of the semester, and this was really the whole semester as well, um, they were contributing to the Red Hill Cemetery Project um, as sort of a, a way to apply what they had been reading about to a case study. So as Lynn mentioned earlier, um, the students broke up into three groups, um, one on violence, one on resistance, and one on uh, space and memory. Um, and so over the course of the semester, they've been writing, they've been doing archival research, and they've been writing historical narratives um, related to those themes um, mm -hmm. about Red Hill, about Waycross, and about sort of the larger um, context of, of Georgia history. Um, they've also been individually creating uh, timeline entries that will go on the, we have an interactive timeline that's on the website. So they've been creating entries um, to put on there as well. Um, so it's, it's, been a, it's, it's been a pleasure, you know, being able to combine uh, sort of teaching with, with the sort of public, public history, public facing project that we've been doing the past couple of years. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a little bit about the, the course. That sounds great, thank you. Are there questions from the audience or other participants? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm curious, um, I, we've got a number of the students here who are Spanish majors and Dr. McCarl, you mentioned working with students um with archival material in both english and spanish could you tell us a little bit about kind of what that was like and the challenges and benefits of um, engaging the material that's not um, not only in english sure so the the work that i've done in spanish is all gathered together under the umbrella um, of a project called colonial lab so the antioquia negra digital archive is one piece of that um, i've been working with students in spanish since 2015 um, I've done it in a few different contexts. Um, I started off doing it as an independent, as, as a directed independent study with a couple students to see if it would work, and it worked. So um, since then, I've had students working in a volunteer capacity. Uh, I've had students um, do projects in classes. Uh, like I mentioned earlier in my fall 2019 class, we worked on that um, census from Antioquia. And I've also had students do internships. Um, which is um, the scenario uh, for Melinda. And I think um, if anybody can speak to sort of the benefits of this type of work, uh, it's, it's, um, it's Melinda. Uh, and Lynn also has um, worked with material in Spanish. So I wonder if um, either of them would like to speak to sort of what they've gotten out of it in terms of doing this type of work as, as Spanish majors. Well, um, for me, I worked on a, a different project, not one mentioned in, in this um, Zoom meeting about a, a 1644 Spanish book called Ofer de España. Um, I've worked with Dr. McCarl and two other students on that project in the summer and fall of last year. And I think for me, the fact that the project was in Spanish really helped me because I am a Spanish major, so it helped me um, with my reading comprehension, because obviously a text written in 1644 is more challenging to me, and one portion of the project is translating the chapters that I worked on to English, so that also helped me with that skill of, of translation. Um, yeah, I would say that, well, like, first of all, the way the, um, kind of Spanish major is organized in particular. I think, um, I think there, I think the reason why there are so many Spanish um, professors, but also students, you know, kind of on these panels are uh, there are just so many opportunities to engage with that intersection of 
of language and technology kind of built into the major. Um, so most, I would say most Spanish majors will at some point engage with a course that'll um, bring them into contact with the digital humanities because m many of the Spanish professors are involved with the DHI. Um, as for the benefits uh, for me personally, um, the, the project that I worked on um, in Spanish was um, an another kind of digital edition for Colonial Lab. Um, that was a um, it was a manuscript of a historical piece written by kind of journalist, um, a Colombian journalist, Soledad Cosa de San Pedro. And um, it's her manuscript of a um, article, a historical article on kind of the the early um, early Spanish women in um, Latin America and in, in uh, the Spanish uh, colonies in, in Latin America. So um, the, the actual title is Las Mujeres de los Conquistadores, the, the wives, the, the women of conquistadors. Um, and I would say um, for me, the um, kind of interesting thing of doing this encoding work in Spanish, in kind of my second language, not not native language, um, was that I think I think the encoding process kind of reinforces um, being very. It, it reinforces um, your ability to use the language. Like already in English, um, you have to look pretty closely. You have to uh, take notice of kind of grammatical structures, writing quirks in English. And that's perhaps a bit easier if it's your native language. Um, but but in Spanish, it was kind of had that extra level of difficulty. It wasn't, you know, my first language. And and also I had to get used to this particular author's um, kind of general sentence structure, get get used to that. Um, and I thought that I thought that experience was was beneficial to kind of um, to to see a bit more variation because oftentimes in kind of standard coursework with textbooks um they use very standardized kind of textbook spanish um and so so seeing someone's not just kind of edited published work but seeing a manuscript kind of with flaws and all all the quirks of someone's writing style um that definitely for me um helped me kind of develop um, better, better language skills, I would say. Thank you. One, one other thing I would add, and I, I, this applies, I think, to um, everything that's been discussed today. I, I think working with um, textual editing projects can give students a chance to work with archival materials, uh, primary source documents that they're usually not going to encounter in Spanish classes or in most other kinds of classes. Um, and I think that that, in the, in, the, in, the, in the context of working with these colonial era documents, I think it gives students a, a different way to think about um, written objects and, and sort of the materiality of written objects uh, that doesn't often come up in, co in contexts that are more focused on um, literature uh, or the literary uh, aspects of texts. Um, but I also think it just it, uh, sort of most students haven't had the chance to engage directly with cultural heritage objects. Um, of that sort. So when we're, we're working with manuscripts, we're, you know, we're working from images of the manuscript or on rare occasions we get to actually see the manuscript itself. Um, and I think that that provides kind of a, a direct connection, um, sort of an eye opening um, experience that uh, I think can be really valuable for students. Anne, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just had a question or comment for Joshua about um, the food um, cataloging, or I, I'm not sure how you would yeah. describe that, sort of the food inventory and the, um, the analysis that you were doing with that. If you, if you said so already, and then I apologize, but do you have plans for that, for sort of like a public facing? I think there's, the reason I ask and this is the sort of the comment part is I think that there's a lot of public interest in history of food, especially local food, as you said, food that's characterized as kind of soul food or, or comfort food um, and the regional sort of associations with food. I think there's a lot of um, just a lot of public interest in in those uh, 
kinds of stories. And I also wanted to um, make some suggestions for some local resources if you want, if you wanted them, and we can do that offline a different time. But um, I wondered if you had plans for those. Um, yeah, uh, I know me and Dr. True talked about some things and then Professor Heffernan as well, like about expanding it. Um, and then another person who were, who was in like a lot of our like Friday meetings, uh, Jennifer Gray emailed me some stuff about Dora Neale Hurston and like her, she has a book about food as well. Um, and she ties it in the folklore. So yeah, I would love to expand it. I know, um, I have to present it. Uh, but yeah, no, I, um, yeah, if you, if anyone has anything, uh, I guess, uh, any advice about this or anything they'd like to see, um, feel free to email me or like message me in the chat, um, to find out my email, I can just post it in there. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, yes, <laughs> I will definitely be expanding it and looking more into it because that's what grabbed my attention. That was I didn't know what exactly I was going to hone in on in the internship, but then just reading it and like going over it, I realized that that sticks out quite a bit. And I think it mattered to them because I mean, they're remembering this like after they've been um, emancipated and everything, and they still go back to these specific things. So I think it's definitely a valuable part of their history. Um, I would like to add as well, you know, um, Joshua in our conversations, in addition to talking about the, the various values of food, you were also identifying um, ways in which food was used as, you know, I think this is where that term economy came from, that, that a lot of the people who were in the FWP um, interviews, that a lot of, there were a number of, of interviews where we read about um, people using food as a way to or, or not telling their stories until they were able to enact something that, um, you know, if people would say, for example, I'm, I sure am hungry, or I might, I might be able to remember something a little more clearly if I, you know, if I had eaten today, and then the interviewer would provide food the next time, would bring some food um, with them the next time. So they were using this as a tool to, to get what they needed and also before giving what the interviewer wanted. Yes, actually, that's a very good point. So kind of like food is important, like, before and after, like even after, like, like even outside the narrative, like it's still a very important part. Thanks, I just wanna to say too that all of these research projects are, are works in progress, right? So it, I, I hope I didn't put you on the spot, certainly Joshua, but, um, but I also always have like, like this immense amount of faith that students are gonna come up with something really creative that I wouldn't have thought of, for example, or that many of us faculty may, may not think of. So um, anyways, great work, everyone. Well, we actually we have an hour and a half on this panel um, instead of the hour that we had last time. <laughs> so um, if you <laughs> If you all have additional comments or questions for each other, that's great. If you um, have the energy and wherewithal, we've got prepared questions to, to ask, um, or if you're feeling tapped, <laughs> we can. Um... David, did you have a question? I, I, saw, I, I thought I saw your hand raised. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about kind of the, all of these projects together. And as someone who's fairly new to public facing um, work, um, frankly, new to the post 15th century. Um, one of the things that has struck me um, in these kinds of public facing projects, particularly um, ones that deal with uh, Africana history, culture, in this particular political moment is sort of navigating a lot of various pressures. And I'm wondering if anyone here has kind of observed that or seen ways in which these public facing projects present different kinds of challenges than what I'm more comfortable with uh, in a kind of academic context where you're presenting to um, colleagues who share at least common training, if not common readings of the documents you're presenting.
Well, I guess I don't know if you wanted if <laughs> if you wanted to talk about our own <laughs> our own you know experiences with some of these challenges, but um, yeah. So the red for the Red Hill Cemetery project, um, you know, we've recently been a, experiencing a little bit of a little bit of pushback um, to some of the narratives that the students have been um, discovering, particularly along along the lines of you know various forms of racial violence that. African Americans faced in Waycross, um, you know, during the late 19th through through the mid 20th century, um, and so you know we've been having conversations um, about ways to kind of navigate relationships, right, with community partners um, when you do face that kind of resistance, um, and so that's something that my students and I have been talking about in class. Um, you know, we went up to Red Hill and into the Okanokee Heritage Center uh, last month. Um, and we're kind of thinking about that too, right, as we were navigating the actual space of the cemetery and of the center. Um, so that's, you know, and, and it's something that, you know, what, when you are uncovering and recovering difficult histories, um, you know, you probably will, will inevitably face um, when you are working with community partners who, you know, May may offer a little bit of resistance to that to those narratives. That's something that we've been experiencing. And if anybody has advice on <laughs> on uh, navigating that, or if if you all have had similar challenge, have experienced similar challenges. And I I would add just as a follow up, we had sort of similar experiences in when we were called upon to provide some context for the recent renaming discussion of the high schools within Duval County. Um, some of the historical narratives that were being presented received a lot of pushback and ultimately um, it was determined that our continued uh, uh, contributions were not terribly welcome. Uh, and we were, we were asked um, to, uh, well, we, we were simply not asked back um, to provide additional context. Um, and I, I'm, and, and not to be, because I am, I'm so excited about all the things that everybody's doing. So I don't want to turn this in a really sort of scary direction, but I'm also thinking about this in terms of, in a context in which faculty, particularly junior faculty are perhaps concerned about tenure, um, are concerned about some of the new legislation related to uh, the, you know, making positions more precarious. Um, you know, do we as public historians or public facing digital humanities uh, uh, projects, is that, is that something new? Is it always been there? Do we need, you know, does this change what we do in any way? I would, um, I think others can speak better to that, but I would point out that the, the, the doing digital work as an untenured faculty member has always been sort of a risky proposition, uh, even aside from the political considerations that you, that you bring into because of um, the difficulty that, uh, you know, universities have in, in placing value on these things. I, I think at UNF, we've been fortunate that there's been, um, the institution has been very receptive to this kind of work. Um, but I think that's, it's sort of a double potential issue for untenured faculty, because even just the fact of doing DH work that doesn't fit closely within sort of the expectations of a, of a specific disciplinary area can be, um, can be tricky. Um, this question is not fully formulated, but hopefully we can get to uh, my, my brain can take me to the end of it uh, as I'm as I'm saying it um, to to those involved in more community based projects, um, you know, like the, the Red Hill Cemetery project and other projects that are, um, you know, pertaining to uh, community history in Jacksonville. Um, what steps do we take uh, to sort of integrate the students into having like a consistent functioning knowledge of the community and like a way to actually be able to interact with the community. So I guess our work is not as 
uh, maybe, you know, divorced just behind a computer uh, and we're actually going out and, you know, doing work and, uh, you know, engaging and interacting with, you know, community members, uh, you know, um, who might have some interesting insights that, uh, um, that potentially can't be uh, found in, say, you know, like written archival material, because I know that there's, you know, power in, you know, storytelling and community history that people just have, you know, stored up in their heads. So I was wondering with, uh, you know, with the people who are involved in these projects, is it, uh, is that something that we take into consideration? Do we try to, you know, engage with uh, the people of the communities? And is there any, is there any resistance uh, from the communities? Is it is it just like an easy process to talk to people, or is it, uh, you know, does it become challenging trying to sort of be, you know, an outsider going into a community, learning their history, and then trying to figure out, you know, uh, uncover some of the secrets or reveal some of the uh, uh, some of the truths from the past? Yeah, uh, that, that's a great question, uh, Matthew. And we were just. Uh, talking about that yesterday in my the kind of final class for the Blackness and Archives course that I that I was talking about earlier. Um, and one comment from one of the students, William William Velez, uh, really kind of highlights sort of what you're saying. And he said you know, the importance of going to the source. Um, and for him, and I think for for a lot of the students in the course, it was you know for the whole semester they had been doing archival research and. And it was all, you know, engaging with digital and digitized material just because of access. Um, and so actually when we went up to Waycross and we visited the cemetery and then visited the center, you know, they, they um, you know, uh, met the, the chair of the Black Heritage Committee, Dr. Rivers, and they met uh, the director of the center, Carla King and others. So I, I think actually being in the space itself helped a lot and helped make the project less abstract um, and to, to make it feel real, like they were doing real work that was contributing in a meaningful way. Um, and so, you know, like I said, with that, you know, came up conversations about, you know, how, how do we do these narratives, right? How do we navigate uh, resistance from some of the community partners in presenting these difficult histories and I think being in the space itself sort of generated those those types of conversations. So yes, I, and it's you know we've always you know approached this project with the with the acknowledgement that it's important to for everybody to have an equal seat at the table, right? That we're not just you know experts from UNF, you know, not even in Georgia, right? Coming into Georgia and you know. Uh, sort of saying that we're the experts, right? And that we need to tell these narratives that instead we're trying to think about, okay, what stories do they, do do um, the community members, right? The descendants of folks who are buried there, what stories do they want us to tell? Um, and so I think always having that, right? As your approach um, and really thinking about these public facing projects as partnerships um, and as, as, as uh, sites of collaboration rather than kind of a one way, it's bi-directional, right? It's not a kind of one way we're offering this expertise and now you're going to consume it. It's how can we work together to do these type of work? Does anyone else wanna chime in on that, that question or these two questions because they seem to dovetail so, that relationship that you're establishing with students, with these community partners, and in the face of, of challenges to the work, um, how, are, how have you navigated and kind of made things, um, made the relationships smoother? So maybe, um, I don't know, James, if you have insights about Lincolnville or, um, you know, Laura, to talk a little bit about the the real-time interviews with people who knew Viola Muse or work being planned for classes. Just real quick about the public facing component and um, Felicia, I, I really liked how you said it's a, a relationship. Um, 
the rhetoric in the digital humanities or some of the, the writing, um, writing is so fun. I mean, the word rhetoric is the Greek word, um, retro, a bargain, uh, a, a bargain between two people. So, um, sorry, my internet's a little wonky, but um, the, uh, the pop-up archive, especially, um, Josh, we're gonna be talking about this a little bit uh, tomorrow for our final class, um, but that, you know, we see archives as a conduit um, as a, not, not as a repository, but a conduit. Um, so I like Felicia, what you, what you said about there, there's motion, it's action. Um, it, it's, it's movement. So thanks. I think, I mean, one thing I would say about the Viola Muse project is that when we applied for funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities to publish this collection, they were very concerned to understand in writing that there were no living descendants of Muse who might, you know, who might have their own claims on this material or, you know, wishes about how it would be published. Um, and there weren't, we did, you know, we, we, we made sure of all of that. Um, and we also felt good about publishing this work, which was part of a federal, you know, sort of works progress administration project and not really personal papers as such. But I think it's interesting to note that, you know, institutions like the National Endowment for the Humanities are more and more kind of reckoning with this long history in which um, universities, museums, cultural centers um, have had a lot of power in terms of um, what gets represented and how it gets represented and trying to kind of settle the balance a little bit and take into account, you know, living regular people out there who might have their own claims or their own stories um, about material and to kind of make sure that they're not sort of putting their foot in things. Um, so that was an interesting moment. I mean, for us, you know, Muse only, she only passed away in the early 80s. So there's plenty of people in Jacksonville who remember her. Um, she ran a kindergarten out of her home um, in the in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. So people knew her as a teacher. They knew her um, you know, in all sorts of ways. And so I am, you know, I think we are really cognizant of the fact that we're telling one story of, about her, um, but it's not necessarily the story. And the question of how you determine how, what a community wants, um, you know, I think that how you go about figuring out what that is, I, that's a whole, that could be a whole panel in and of itself. And, you know, we probably should, could, you know, continue to do that sort of work. We had a panel, the DHI hosted a panel on this topic last year in the spring. Um, and I think it does vary depending on whether you're working with a, a specific site um, like Red Hill, whether you're working through a community um, center of cultural memory, um, you know, like Dr. Beasley does in Lincolnville, um, or then whether you're, you know, kind of working, you know, with the materials, you know, that are related to a single person who herself kind of threaded through various institutions in the community. So I will just say like, I mean, it's a great question, Matthew. And I think it's, um, I think it's an ongoing challenge, not just how to, how to get students to think about things in those terms, but how we kind of reckon with that and, um, and forge those relationships and really, it, cause it really is kind of a classic research problem of you don't know what you don't know, you know? Um, and that's, that's a difficult, you know, sort of road to navigate, I think. I, I would just add um, both to, well, to, to all of the previous speakers, to Laura, to Jim and, and to, uh, to Felicia, this importance of building these relationships. And I kind of reminded um, one of the figures that loomed very large in the early period, early part of this project was um, Willie Character, Mr. Character. Um, he had been working on aspects of Red Hill and had been very interested in pushing the Black Heritage Committee forward in its um, claiming of the property. Um, so they now actually have ownership uh, of the site on which the cemetery is located. But it was clear from the beginning that he, he had reason to be concerned about what we were doing. Like, were we coming in and just, as, as uh, Dr. Bevel said, uh, kind of telling them how it was going to be, uh, pushing them aside? And he wanted, he asked very pointed questions, like, what are you doing? You know, what, what do you want from this? And I think being open and honest and, and building those relationships and adjusting, I mean, if, if, 
what you are, what you imagined in the beginning isn't going to work in the context of that relationship, then being willing and able to make those adjustments um, to ensure that that collaboration goes forward in a fruitful way, um, I think is important. And, and, and Mr. Character passed away recently. So I was just sort of reminded of that early um, interaction and how important it was to him um, that he trusted us, right? That we weren't gonna just come in, not only from you know, out of Waycross, but out of state altogether uh, and present a particular project um, and foist it upon them. This has been a, a productive conversation. We actually have only 10 minutes left of the hour and a half. <laughs> so um, thank you for being so engaged. Um, we've been talking obviously about, you know, these relationships with community members and um, the benefits of this work for, for students and what they've learned. What, um, I, I guess, um, you know, getting to some of our, of our other questions that we wanted to have us think about. What do you think um, is the role of public history in maybe shaping communities? Do you think that this work has an impact in terms of community organizing or, you know, the, the work that the community wants to do, you know, getting back to, to Laura's comment about, you know, it's hard sometimes for us to know what the community wants, but the community often knows what it's want, what it wants. So have communities used any of this work or do you envision communities using any of this work for some of the, the things that they have in mind for their own futures? Well, I'll jump in briefly. I don't wanna, I feel like I've been uh, talking a little too much, um, but, for the Red Hill Cemetery project, we've seen they have a the Black Heritage Committee um, has a, a Facebook page with about a thousand um, members. Um, they've been posting uh, very weekly, really, on activity that's been going on around the cemetery. Um, it's led to conversations uh, between individuals who maybe had left the community, you know, hadn't lived in Waycross for a long time. Um, there's conversation, people are starting to, to say, hey, I'm really interested in doing an interview or an oral history. Um, a, another member of the community noted, they went to our, our webpage and noticed some photographs that we had up of some of the, of the headstones and like, oh, that's my, my grandfather. Um, and so I think in, in terms of community building, both within Waycross and now with the sort of magic of, of these digital connections, it's bringing the, the Waycross diaspora um, back into the community um, in very, I think, productive and, and exciting ways. Um, in fact, when we were conducting the last interview, uh, we interviewed um, uh, a woman who, who currently lives in Macon, but had been out of Georgia for a long time. Um, but they happened to run into another, uh, you know, who person who still lives in Waycross, but they were able to reconnect and talk about uh, that those connections. So yeah, I mean, I, I've seen it in real ways, um, helping to to build new, reinforce existing communities and build new ones. That's great. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything to add or share? I would just add that um, the from the, the work that we've been doing with the, the Viola Muse collection, um, there are so many documents that deal with, um, the, that's, that sort of help to create what the community, what African-American communities in Jacksonville were like in the 30s. Um, I, I can't speak to how you know communities today would use that, but it seems to me that there's a clear value in being able to, to see into this world that is 
the sort of human world that's gone, but also uh, the geographical world that has been uh, altered so dramatically since then. Um, we've been mapping the documents and trying to uh, make it possible for, for users of the site to visualize uh, this world that's gone, but which can be overlaid over the world that we know that we drive through every day. Um, you know, my neighbor's kids go to La Villa and, you know, every day they drive through these, these streets that we've been mapping uh, what was there in the 30s, those things are all gone. Um, all of us, you know, drive through downtown, we drive through those neighborhoods without necessarily uh, being able to experience um, what was there before. So uh, I think that there's a there's a sort of value in, in uh, providing windows into, um, I guess, worlds that are that are gone now. Hmm. True. We've oh, that's that's correct. Like, yep. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna. I was just gonna say real quick um, to echo what Clayton just said. At our library panel uh, back in March, uh, Ennis Davis really um, uh, talked about the the potential for that kind of work in in the work that he does. So mm -hmm. that that was a really um, great conversation there. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Laura. Um. Well, I was going to mention, I mean, I think some of the work that Amelia is doing and that the Red Hill Cemetery Project is doing in, in terms of trying to think about how to open up these materials so that they could be used in K through 12 uh, teaching in Jacksonville, that seems like the next kind of wave for these collective projects. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I, it's not going to, I don't think it's going to be easy, is what I will just say. Um, and I think, um, not not even solely for political reasons like you know for logistical reasons for the ways that we kind of interface with um public school systems and their own modes of um, curriculum and assessment and so on so it does seem in terms of relationship building and community building that this is like this is the next logical kind of step for all of us and um and I'd be interested in sort of seeing like a panel like this or a symposium a day-long symposium that involved not just us you know um but also uh dcps teachers or you know teachers from other counties in the area great idea so we will need to be working on that for the fall won't we well thank you everyone this has really been a a, a bright spot and this um last week of classes so i appreciate your time and your energy and your engagement with this conversation today that's been wonderful to hear from so many students and um, faculty members and to have community members present in the audience as well so thank you all for your time and thank you my co-hosts um, you all enjoy the rest of this week <laughs>